we have a new set of headlines. Even though for three straight months, every scientist around the world was saying, we're studying children. We're trying to understand why they aren't getting sick. Now the media that, is, that, that Peter Bregan just described as trying to infuse fear to do what? To control you is saying this. Tonight, two children in New York have died from a mysterious illness that could be linked to coronavirus. An inflammatory condition possibly connected to coronavirus. The evidence that the novel coronavirus can cause severe illness in children. Now, this five, the five-year-old boy was from New York City. He died on Thursday. He is being treated at Mount Sinai for inflammatory systems similar to Kawasaki disease and toxic shock syndrome. Children have been hospitalized with symptoms which initially look like sepsis, and some of those patients have tested positive for COVID-19. Health experts say some of the children with the inflammatory condition also test positive for coronavirus. They've not yet had any reports of Kawasaki-like symptoms in connection with kids who have coronavirus, but they are working to develop a health alert to inform healthcare providers about this possible complication of COVID-19 in kids. Did you hear that last line? We actually don't have any cases whether the coronavirus have Kawasaki's or Kawasaki's are getting coronavirus, but we are putting out a health alert just in case. In fact, in these headlines that we saw, you know, starting to talk about this new health problem. By the way, I have a friend that works deep inside the Democratic Party. He said, bro, they're about to start going after the kids. They're going to try and make it that the kids are at risk. This is about three or four weeks ago. I said, ah, that'll never happen. Everyone in science is saying, you know, that kids aren't affected. He's like, yeah. But the Democratic Party needs to figure out how to lock people down because they're doubling down on this. And I mean, I don't mean to wax political, and this has nothing to do with politics. I'm just telling you what types of things you hear on the inside. And then when you start seeing it happen, you're like, my God, my God, what are we talking about? Kawasaki's disease. And, and just as he said, well, we don't actually have a case of this. Look at one of these headlines. This is a headline. Multiple children in mass sickened by deadly, look at this headline, sickened by deadly coronavirus-related illness. Yet in the paragraph itself, it's occurring about six weeks after a child may have been exposed to a COVID-19 infection, he said. 82 New York City kids diagnosed with mystery illness related to COVID-19. The link between COVID-19 and the syndrome has not been confirmed. Wait a minute, you're going with a headline saying not been confirmed? Some of these studies have been said we tested, and some of the kids didn't actually test positive for having had COVID-19 that had Kawasaki's disease. And that's what it really gets down to is Kawasaki's disease. COVID-19 causes Kawasaki's disease. Folks, let me be really clear, because I've been at this for a few years now, okay? And I worked on the doctor's television show, so I know how you spin, and I know how you make things up, and I know how you use languaging. And everybody that's ever had an issue with vaccines, the pro-medical establishment will say, well, that's anecdotal. The, well, yeah, okay, your child regressed into autism after a vaccine, but a lot of people get vaccines, right? It's just anecdotal that it happened. Well, it didn't happen once. It happened two times. It had 10 times, 10,000 times, 100,000 times, millions of times, yet we still hear it's anecdotal, meaning there could be other reasons to explain that, which is true. That's a scientific truth. But, folks, I have never seen worse science being reported on, headlines saying connected to coronavirus illness, you know, deadly, uh, you know, inflammation of organs caused by coronavirus in the headline, but then it says it hasn't actually uh, been proven. How are you allowed to have a headline? Why am I getting censored and you're putting out headlines like that? And I want to make one real point because anyone that is terrified of Kawasaki's disease, and by the way, I've even had my own kids uh, uh, been approached by adults talking about this as though somehow it's a fact. So it's starting to spread quite rapidly. And let's talk about anecdotal, meaning, well, that's, that's not the only reason. Just because some kids who had COVID-19 now have Kawasaki's does not actually mean that Kawasaki's is caused by COVID-19. In fact, now that we know that some people aren't testing positive for COVID-19, let me give you a better potential theory. How about lockdowns? How about quarantine causes COVID-19? Because I know for a fact, 100% of the kids that are getting Kawasaki's right now have been quarantined over the last three months or whatever period of time it lasted in their state. So perhaps lack of vitamin D or no sunshine or you know, lack of contact with other children or maybe lack of contact with bacteria and viruses causes COVID, I mean, causes Kawasaki's disease. But see, those are all speculations by someone that just is critically thinking their way through, saying, just because 
does not mean this. So why don't we bring in another specialist that actually knows a lot more than I do about Kawasaki's and these issues, the one and only, world famous, world traveling, interviewed by thousands of news agencies every week, is now taking your time to be with me, and it's an honor, Dr. Sherry Tenpenny. Okay. Hi, Dal. Thanks so much, and I needed a chuckle today, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> You're very welcome. You have been very busy. I see you all over the place, whether it's blogs or news stations. You're obviously out there trying to get out the truth, but this... This is scary, right? I mean, this is some, you know, they're trying to terrify people that their kids are now at risk. I think because most adults are really waking up to the idea that this looks like a nothing burger. This looks like a giant nothing burger. And frankly, I got to get back to work and I don't want to live on unemployment. Now, there's probably adults out there saying, yeah, I'm getting more unemployment than I make at my job. But frankly, I don't feel as good as I do when I have a job. So now mainstream media needs another story, right? We need another story. We need, and I would imagine Anthony Fauci and Deborah Burks may need another story. And Kawasaki's is that story. Uh, children with coronavirus at LA Hospital develop rare inflammatory condition, possibly linked to COVID-19. Good on you, Fox, for at least using the word possibly. What are the odds that this is, is happening? What's going on here? Is, can Kawasaki's be caused by COVID-19? Well, first of all, you know, Kawasaki's disease, it's a, it's a name, that, it's a, a diagnosis that's used for a vasculitis. And a vasculitis is an inflammation of your blood vessels, primarily your arteries. And Kawasaki's disease is one of the most common causes of vasculitis in children. And it's usually caused by some sort of an infection. So it can be from any infection. Um, so the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the name of the virus, you know, COVID-19 is actually the name of the condition that the virus causes, but it can be caused by any sort of virus, any sort of virus, viruses more than bacteria, it's tr but it's triggered by infection. It's typically, you see it and diagnose it from having a very high fever. They get kind of a nonspecific sort of rash, which lends itself to a, a viral condition because viruses cause rashes. They get very enlarged lymph nodes, but what is typical about, about Kawasaki's and is the most dangerous part of Kawasaki's is that that because the arteries are inflamed, they can get aneurysms in those arteries, which is like a ballooning out to the side. And that's why you hear about that, uh, that when you, kids that have Kawasaki's disease, they have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, and they have problems that happen with their heart because the blood vessels around the heart are frequently affected and infected and cause these, uh, these ballooning out, these aneurysms. But here's the thing that's interesting, Dell. It's not just is this, could this be caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Sure, because it could be caused by any virus, but it's not specific to that virus. It can be any of a number of viruses. And what's really interesting, and they never talk about this, of course, is that the Kawasaki's disease has been reported fairly extensively as side effects go in the medical literature having been caused by vaccines. So really? all of those news reports you just said on that clip, all those news reports on the clip, you know, these kids were in the hospital and they were just diagnosed with Kawasaki's disease. Did you notice that the part of their history they don't talk about is their vaccination history? Did these kids just have a vaccine before they went into the hospital? And as you know now, I mean, whether you've, you you know, whether you've had the illness of COVID-19, whether you've been exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus or not, um, they're all saying that it is. It's, you've seen those memes where people are like run over by steamrollers and there's a tag on their toe that says killed by COVID-19. <laughs> right, you know? right, so they, they, and so, so here's the thing, and, and this is, it was a really big uh, um, analysis that um, did internationally. It was a study that was reported in um, Science Magazine, or science, the Science Journal. The, na the name of the article was Spontaneous Reports of Vasculitis as an Adverse Event Following Immunization, a Descriptive Analysis Across Three International Databases. So they looked at VAERS in the U.S., they looked at EV in Europe, and then they looked at Vigibase that was also in Europe. They had a total of 5,574 cases of vasculitis. 16% of them were Kawasaki's disease. And this was all after these kids had been vaccinated. It was in the time frame was between January 2003 and 2014. So it was a little over 10 years, 5,500 cases after vaccination, 16% of those 
were actually diagnosed with Kawasaki's disease. So you notice distinctly that kids are in the hospital with some unknown infection causing this Kawasaki disease. They never say, well, gee, they were given Prevnar or hepatitis B or Hib or influenza vaccines, or just about any of the other vaccines that we have, meningitis vaccines, Gardasil, all of them have been, rotavirus even, which is an oral, vac oral vaccine, have all had cases of Kawasaki disease that came after those vaccines. Does that, you know, I, I know that, because I've looked into some of this around, you know, uh, measles and rubella and flu, and when we look at pregnant women, you know, there was this idea that the illness, you didn't want to get rubella as a mother when you're pregnant, that that could lead to schizophrenia and things like that. And then we start seeing more science that say it's not actually the virus itself, but it's the immune system's ramp up or reaction to the virus that actually starts causing these issues in pregnant women. Is that any, does that have anything to do with Kawasaki's? Is it the, is this an autoimmune reaction uh, more than something the virus causes? Is it, is it, is it is it an autoimmune condition? I don't think so. I think it's purely just an inflammatory condition. It's an inflammatory right. condition that, that, you know, so autoimmune is different than, I mean, autoimmune diseases have inf an inflammation component, but you okay. can have an inflammation component that's not autoimmune disease. And I believe that this is purely a vasculitis, which is inflammation of the blood vessels and not with a, an autoimmune component to it. So it doesn't matter whether you get this virus breathing it or touching it or getting it in your mouth or having it injected, which is what vaccines essentially are, right? You, you are prone to this. Now, how, I mean, because now people are going to say, well, so it is possible COVID-19 could be doing, but also the flu shot I gave my child when I was told that that was the best way to protect against COVID-19, which I just showed earlier in the show, flu shot, you know, flu zone, death rate of 0.5% uh, in, the, in the studies that we showed. So we know that they have their own injuries already right there. But how common is Kawasaki's just in general for children since any sort of viral infection can cause it? Is this, is this a, a major disease? Well, no. I mean, and, and you have to put that in content. It would be like in relationship to what? I mean, okay. do, is it is, um, is Kawasaki's disease as common as, say, insulin-dependent diabetes? Or is it in common? You have to put it in relationship to what? This is one of those things that we know it's there. You could, you could make a stink and point out, and these are tiny numbers, right? We're talking about 100 children out of 75 million in America, and we, news focuses in on it and says, look, we may have this other issue that we weren't paying attention to. But essentially, this could have been there with the flu or any other type of viral infection. This is something that exists, and they're just, you, I mean, are they using it? As a, let me ask you this. What's your opinion? Why is this suddenly all over the news? Because it's something they can promote because it's something they can terrorize parents with. And it's a reason for them to say, we should now start thinking about this toxic vaccine that they're gonna make and put it into the pediatric schedule, which is kind of amazing to me, Dell, because the main reason they wanna put all the vaccines into the pediatric schedule is so it can be covered by the 1986 Injury Compensation Act. So they can get liability protection for that. But they've already got a, a liability protection on steroids because of the PrEP Act. Because right. the, 19, the 2005 PrEP Act covers them for any measure that's being already made. And they have a, a higher degree of, of liability protection through the PrEP Act than they even did through the 1986 Act. So why they are so hell-bent to election to put this on the children's schedule, I don't, I don't really know. I want to go back to your question, though, because I'm looking at these numbers here. Out of, out of this, that, that study that we were talking about. Okay. If there were, um, if there were, these are just the number of cases of, of, of the spontaneous reports of vasculitis after vaccination between 2003 and 2014. So in a 10 year period of time, there were 5,500, let's say 5,500 cases. So that's not Across very many. three databases in three different countries, right? Three massive international databases. Over, we, over 10 years. Over 10 years. 10 years. And you have thousands they had five, of cases. They I have mean, 55, I happen to know there's 10 million. I think, there's, I think it's 10 million people in VAERS alone, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. Um, actually, no, I'm confusing that with BSD. I'm sorry, but we are talking about like large international databases yeah, over so 10 years. Yeah, so out of a few oh, thousand cases. Right. Oh, Right. Over a 10-year period of time, there's 5,500 cases. So that's about 500 cases per year. 
That's not yeah. very many cases of this, of this inflammatory illness. It's not a lot. So that yeah. should bring anxiety down a lot to how common is this? Not very. It is the most common form of vasculitis, but vasculitis in children is not very common. All right. Well, that was all very enlightening. And Dr. <laughs> Sherry Tenbenny, keep up the great work. Uh, I feel like, you know, people are waking up. They're waking up very quickly. I hope they speed that up. As far as, and, and just really quickly, you know, CDC now saying 0.4% or really 0.26% if we bring in the asymptomatic uh, carriers. Um, what is your feeling? What, you know, what is it going to take? What do people need to hear in order to understand you are safe to walk on this planet once again? There's nothing new going on here. I think we need to do some brain detoxing, tell you the truth. I think that we need to reprogram people of how they're thinking about this because humans learn visually. And so from early on, when they were seeing people of dropping over in the streets in Wuhan and, and wearing the uh, hazmat materials and spraying everything down, and they kept talking about more and more people are dying, dying, dying. I think it's just going to take education, like what I'm doing and what you're doing and Bobby's doing and Dr. Buttar's doing and Judy Mikovits is doing to, to re educate people that the fear factor, it's like they got a, a shot of fear in their brain and we have to detox them from that. Like for example, I've, I've started a thing on my Instagram account that I said, when you hear people say that, oh, you just have to get used to this. This is the new normal. I, you need to say to people, no, 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 that's not correct. This is a temporary abnormal. This is a temporary abnormal. And it's almost when you say that to people, they kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. And it's like right. we have to reprogram what they have, what the mainstream media has been trying to program and condition into their brain. We have to substitute that with something else. So we have to take out the new normal and say, no, no, this is a temporary abnormal. Is this virus going to be deadly? <laughs> is this good virus going to be deadly? No, no, it's just the same as any other flu. Were you having the same sort of anxiety and wearing a mask and being horrified in the last five years over catching the flu? Well, no. Well, then you shouldn't be about this either because more people died then than they died now. And so right. we have to reprogram people's brains, I think. And I think starting with this is just a temporary abnormal is sort of a great place to start. Great information. That's a great point. I'm going to carry that through to the end of the show. Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, take care. I will see you out there on the circuit. Of course, people, you really need to look at what she's doing. When we talk about being uh, visible, go to her research li library, Tenpenny Research Library, uh, where you can get really honestly this brilliant doctor has covered and has more details on everything you want to know about the vaccinations about your health there it all is you can click on any one of those and have contact to probably the most prolific database that exists on these subjects if you like that clip then be sure to check out our live broadcast of the high wire every thursday morning at 11 a.m pacific time you can watch it on Facebook, YouTube, iTunes, and Twitter. We'll see you there.